live. Welcome back to Prophecy 3 DNA, where we discover, decrypt, and demystify Bible prophecy and apply it. My name is Donnie Alvarenga, and this is my brother, Don DeCuna, and we are honored to be facilitating the study of the Bible and end time events. Um, over the past several weeks, we have been diving into the third cycle of church seal trumpets, and we are in the trumpet of the third cycle if that makes sense last week we start we kicked it off and we reviewed how there was a star that was hurled into the water and made the water bitter bitter was that what it was poison poison and um we learned that that star was lucifer and we stopped at the point where he was called actually wormwood and so that's what we're going to be diving into today is that correct don correct so um go ahead and uh, can you pray to start us out please our father in heaven thank you so much for providing us insight into what to expect um and providing us um evidence of how real you are please be with us now as we study your word that we may understand what you want us to understand in jesus name i pray amen amen so just to do a quick recap we'll just read it real quick go back here All right, so we'll read it again. And it is, a third, uh, the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven burning like a torch and fell a third of the rivers and the springs of water on a third of the rivers and the springs of waters. The name of this star is Wormwood and a third of the waters became Wormwood and many men died from the waters because they were made bitter, okay? So we left off on the translation or the interpretation of what this wormwood is. We, we interpreted what the great star was. Okay. So now we can go back to where we were today and the great star, right? So the great star, we went through the, the text of scriptures and that is specifically the fallen star. The fallen star was the fallen angel and the fallen angel was Lucifer the dragon, the serpent, right? Then we went through and we studied what is a name symbolic of, just period, right? Because in the Bible, names mean things, right? We, we, we illustrated that by so far in the scriptures, Jesus is only described as Jesus very early on in the book of Revelation. But subsequently to that, Jesus is described as the one with the two-edged sword in his mouth. He is described as the, the, the lamb with seven eyes and seven horns that was slain. He is described as the one who is, who died, but lives again. He is described as the true and faithful witness. Does that make sense? Okay. So Jesus is described as all these characteristics. So is Satan. Okay. Satan is described as the great fallen star. Satan is now being described as Wormwood. So all these names are describing characteristics or their reputation. So we need to understand what is Wormwood? What does that mean? Okay, this is where we left off last week. Oops. So let's learn Wormwood. Okay, but before we get into the text, this is the actual word that is used. Okay. And it is absinthian. Okay. Have you ever heard of something that sounds like absinthian? Have you ever heard of this? Absinthe. Absinthe. Like it's absinthe? actually an alcoholic beverage. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. But it is wormwood. This is what is being said in Revelation. The name of the star which fell on the waters and made them bitter. Okay? Absinthian. All right? So, specifically, it's only one place in the Bible. Revelation 8.11. All right? And the name of the star is called Wormwood. Okay? Absinthian. But in the Old Testament, it's also a word that is used. Okay? And in the Old Testament... It is this word right here in Hebrew called la'ana, okay? 
and this one is also wormwood okay and it it is another word specifically known as hemlock okay so in the old testament it is known as wormwood but it is also known as hemlock they're synonyms they're interchangeable ultimately these are toxic or poisonous plants that's what we need to understand they are toxic to whatever you put um, these plants into they are harmful to us all right so we can already see that the characteristics of absinthe or hemlock or wormwood are toxic to human consumption okay so th that's the preamble to all of this <laughs> so now let's read some passages that describe this either absinthian which is wormwood or laana which is also wormwood or hemlock so go ahead and read this we already read this but we'll read it again revelation 8 11 the name of this star is wormwood a third of the waters became wormwood and many died many men died from the waters because they were made bitter all right let's read this one deuteronomy 29 18 lest there be among you a man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away today from the lord our god to go and serve the gods of these nations unless there be among you a root bearing poisonous and bitter fruit okay so here this word that's highlighted in green poisonous and the word that's used for bitter is the word laana which means uh, a hemlock or a, a a toxic fruit okay a, a, a fruit of wormwood let's keep reading proverbs 5 3 through 6 for the lips of an immoral woman drip as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil but her end is bitter as wormwood sharp as a two-edged sword her feet go down to death her steps take hold of shoal she does not ponder the path of life her ways are unstable and she does not know it <clears throat> okay so the ultimate concept here okay is this if you ingest wormwood what will be your state what's your end state if you ingest wormwood death right here what is the color of the associated horse in the third seal black black darkness what is the symbology associated with black and darkness death death i'm recording do you understand so we see how right now is do we understand how the cycle synchronize that when something is being described in the seals it's also being aligned to the trumpets okay let's keep reading Jeremiah 9, 2 through 6. Oh, that I had in the wilderness a lodging place of wayfaring men, that I might leave my people and go from them. For they are for they all are adulterers, an assembly of treacherous men. They bend their tongues like their bow, lies and not truth prevail upon the land. For they proceed from evil to evil, and they do not know me, says the Lord. Let everyone be on guard against his neighbor, and do not trust in any brother. For every brother supplants, and every neighbor walks about with slanders. Everyone deceives his neighbor and does not speak the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. They weary themselves in committing iniquity. Your habitation is in the midst of deceit. Through deceit, they refuse to know me, says the Lord. Okay, so this leads into the rest of what we're going to talk about in the same passage in Jeremiah. What is the overall theme of what's being described here? Um, Like adultery and treachery and deceit deception mm -hmm. treachery deception treachery slanders what's what's another name for slander you're lying about someone else okay deception do not trust what these people are saying now let's read the rest of jeremiah Jeremiah 9, verse 8, their tongue is a deadly arrow, it speaks deceit. One speaks peaceably to his neighbor with his mouth, but in his heart he lies in wait. Let's keep reading in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 13 through 15, and the Lord said, because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, nor walked in it, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart, and after the ba bales which their father taught them. Therefore, thus, thus says the Lord of 
hosts, the God of Israel. I will feed them, even this people, with wormwood and give, give them water of gall to drink. Okay. So this is something that happened in ancient Israel. Guess what's happening to God's church now in the third seal or the third trumpet? Is yeah. God once again giving them wormwood to drink? Is he giving it to them? Okay. They practice and enjoy deceit and lies. So did God give them lies back in the day? It's not God a trick did, question. Did God give it to them? That's what I'm saying is he didn't okay. give it to them. He allowed it maybe? How does God give them? We've, we've studied this in the past. How does God give them these lies? Remember when we talked about Job, when, when we, we did that quick study on Job, what did God, what was the only thing God had to do for Job to be attacked by the devil? He allowed it. He withdrew his protection. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So that was a very isolated case because Job was actually doing the right thing. But here we see how these people, they're all about lies and deception. So what is God doing in this case? He's saying, you want lies and deception? Okay, I will give you the source, the fountain of lies and deception. Because I'm going to not... Uh, uh, I'm not going to stop him. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If you want the fountain, if you want the source of lies, have at it. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Why? Because they have forsaken my laws. They have not obeyed my voice nor walked in it. Mm -hmm. Not only that but they have walked after the imaginations of their own hearts and idolatry that their fathers taught them. Okay? So, did God give them wormwood? He gave them wormwood by the proxy of just saying, okay, you want it, you got it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, he did it to ancient Israel, did he not? Right. Okay, when we were doing our study of, of, of you know, God's force or judgment, all right, the active agent of the actual punishment is the devil doing it. But the reason the devil is doing it is because God let him do it. It's God's permissive will that allows the devil to do it. But the reason that God allows the devil to do it is because we asked him for it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this specific sense here, we see this happening again. Where the church refused to listen to the truth. And so God says, you don't want the truth? Remember. What was one of the things that happened in the seals also? It wasn't just the black horse rider with the scales. What else was in the third seal? I don't remember. Was there something with bread? Was there going to be a lack of bread? Remember? Mm -mm. Wheat and barley was going to be oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. in short supply? Yes. Okay. So... There was going to be a famine for the word of God. Remember, we also read that passage. There will come a time where there will be a famine for the word of God. You will search for it high and low and you will not find it. Why? Because you didn't want it. Right? If you don't want God's word, God won't supply it. Does that make sense? Right. So when God doesn't supply it, the only thing left is for you to walk after your own imagination. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So as it happened to ancient Israel, so it happened to the church. 
Now, if God is not supplying um, through the Holy Spirit, if God is not supplying a, a real foundational understanding of Scripture, who is now supplying the foundational understanding of Scripture? This agent called Wormwood. The problem is that Wormwood is what? What is Wormwood? It's poisonous. Not only is it poisonous, but it is this. Deceptive. It is deceptive. And it also leads to death and the grave. Okay? So, Wormwood is the devil's noxious, cursed, toxic, anesthetic, poisonous behavior. Because remember, not only did they die from the waters, it says the water, the men turned into wormwood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? The men began to reflect the same characteristics of wormwood. So as they were deceived, guess what they begin to do? Deceive others. Propagate the deception. Okay? Right. So when we see deception enter and filter through the church, by the third and fourth generation of this deception, do you think those people honestly understood they were deceived? No, because it is as it always has been. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. The deception has been so ingrained. Who are you to question now the learned ancients? The, the church fathers. This is what they've always taught us. Doesn't mean it was ever, it doesn't mean it was ever right. Does that make sense? Let me just turn my mic down just a hair because it's a little hot. Okay. Why do I say to toxic, anesthetic, and poisonous? Because as we studied earlier, wormwood is of the hemlock family. Okay. And wormwood itself is a real thing. It is an actual plant. So what I did is I studied and I looked up wormwood and also other plants that are of the hemlock family. And I saw what type of plants are they and why are they so toxic? So what I'm going to do here, let me pause this for a second. All right. So we're going to study real quick. What are some of the characteristics of plants in the wormwood and hemlock family? Okay. Okay. So, let's read this. Read this, and this is from Wikipedia talking about this plant called Secudia, which is in the hemlock and wormwood family. So, go ahead and read. All members of Secuda contain high levels of the poisonous principle Secutoxin, an unsaturated aliphatic alcohol that is structurally closely related to the toxin onanthotoxin found in the plant hemlock water dropwort. Its primary toxic effect is to act as a stimulant in the central nervous system. Sicutoxin is very poisonous and water hemlock is considered one of North America's most toxic plants. Ingestion of Sicuta can be fatal in humans and there are reports in medical literature of severe poisoning and death as early as 1670. Okay, so the reason I picked this one specifically because this is one that grows near water, okay? The hemlock we're concerned of is the hemlock or the wormwood that, that hits the water, okay? But it is highly, and it is what? Toxic. Toxic. Okay, let's look at the next one. Oh, man. Read this. The poisonous members of the Apiaceae have been used for a variety of purposes globally. The poisonous Onantha crocata has been used as an aid in suicides and arrow poisons have been made from various other family species. Dacus carota has been used as coloring for butter. Dorema ammoniacum, Ferula galbaniflua, and Ferula moscata 
are sources of incense. The woody azarella compacta fill has been used in South America for fuel. Okay. So it is what? Poisonous. But deadly. here, right here. It's AIDS and suicides and arrow poisons. Why would you need arrow poisons? To kill somebody. And what do you need suicide? What is suicide's purpose for? To kill yourself. Yourself. Okay. Let's look at this one. Um, what are we reading? It's another one of the hemlock family. It is a muscle relaxant that causes death by paralyzing the respiratory system, resulting in asphyxiation. <laughs> okay. So one of the other characteristics is that, is it in something that happens quickly? No. No. How does this kill you? Um, by asphyxiation. Okay. But specifically? It's a muscle relaxant, basically a paralyzing agent. It's a paralyzing agent. So it comes on slow. Okay. It's a slow acting and eventually you become useless. Okay. And there is no longer any breath in you. Does that make sense? Mm hmm So the way this toxin works, if we apply it in a spiritual sense now, where did my mouse go? Okay. It works slowly. It anesthetizes us, desensitizes us. Does that make sense? Mm hmm and it sucks the spirit out of us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it is basically a false spirit. It's, it's not the true spirit of God. It is a replacement spirit. All right. An example of this would be like King Saul. All right. When David was anointed king. It says that the spirit of the Lord rested upon him. The very next, the very next verse, it says, and the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And as you continue reading, it says, and another spirit entered Saul and it tormented him. That's what's happening here. So you have the spirit of the Lord departing from the church <laughs> and another spirit entering the church. But that spirit is not the spirit that reflects God's character. But it's okay in um, replicating what God did. Does that make sense? No. Okay, so remember I said that there's two ways that the devil attacks. What, what are the ways he does it? If you can't join... Um... Kill them, join them. Okay, so what is Wormwood doing here? Is it beating or is it joining? Joining. Okay. So what the Bible is showing us here is that as the Holy Spirit kind of says, you don't want to listen to me? Okay. Another spirit enters the church but co-opts all of what the church has already accomplished. And again, all the devil has to do at this point is do minor deviations, understanding that those minor deviations now will be major deviations years from now. A perfect example of that would be this. If I leave, you know, I'm heading to Cincinnati, right? I live, I live just outside of Dayton. I want to go south on the I-75, okay? And I'm heading south on the I-75, but all I do to my steering wheel is turn maybe like half a degree to the right as I'm driving. But I never correct that. I never correct that. I might be okay for the first two or three miles. 
But what I can guarantee you is that after those two or three miles, I'm either going to get off on an exit or I'm going to be driving into a cornfield. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because you're further and further away from where you started and where you want to go. And I never corrected that deviation. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. If I deviated very small initially and never corrected that deviation, the deviation gets larger from my initial path. Right. And so the car doesn't know I'm getting off the highway. The car doesn't know I'm crossing the white line. The car doesn't care that my tires are hitting the rumble strips and that now I'm in a cornfield and I'm hitting a, you know, a BP gas station. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cause I never corrected that minor deviation. The devil understands that. But we as, as, as Christians are, are so, we're so bad at studying our own history <laughs> that we don't even know that there was a deviation. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And because we don't understand prophecy, we don't know what wormwood means. Okay. Why don't we know what wormwood means? Because we don't know what Jeremiah meant way back when. So we don't know what it means when John talks about it happening, oh, by the way, a good two to three hundred years after John. And then when we look at history, because we're going to look at history in this study, and we're going to see, huh, wow, this actually happened to the church. The church did deviate in minor things. But yet, when we see it's 2022, Currently, that is what, 1700 years afterwards? Look how far we've come since then. Where back then, there weren't so many denominations. Now, I think there's something like over 1500 Christian denominations. Something went amiss if we're that far off from Christ. From primitive Christianity. Does that make sense? Mm hmm Okay. So do we understand a little bit more about Wormwood? Yes. It is the character of that spirit of Satan. So it wasn't just that his character is toxic, anesthetic, and poisonous. Okay? Leading to death. What type of death? Spiritual death of the church. Okay? It, it, it kills the spiritual life right here. This is the key thing. It kills the spiritual life. Church now becomes a ritual vice a relationship. It, it becomes, um, you know, uh, uh, just watching, uh, you know, the World Cup is going on right now. And I can't tell you how many times I see a player, you know, they do the, you know, players will replace each other on the field, right? And one player will be leaving and the other player will be going on the field. And I can't tell you how many players I see when they're about to go on the field, they, they have to do the sign of the cross as they cross over into the field. And that is a ritual. Does that make sense? It's, it's a, a habit. I'm not knocking them for this habit or this ritual. But what I'm trying to show is that there's a difference between a relationship and a ritual. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so these are examples of, of how a relationship with God can, can, can get replaced by a ritual. Mm -hmm. And where a ritual replaces a relationship, it becomes like not the same. It becomes almost um, very superficial. Okay? So, God's permitting here the devil to kind of take over because the church 
embraced that type of behavior. They embraced the world. Because remember, what were the issues with the church from the go? What was the doctrine of Balaam? Do you remember? Um, There's two things. It was um, uh, prostitution and... Fornication. Fornication, yeah. Fornication and... and I forget the other term, but it was... Idolatry. Mm -hmm. And what was fornication? It's um, other gods or other... Well, that's idolatry. Okay, fornication is the civil connecting church and church and state. Yep. So fornication is the the relationship of church and state and idolatry is the relationship between church and other religion does that make sense mm -hmm. okay so how did this happen okay how did this happen and now we're going to start to get into a little bit of history just a little bit of history the church fathers begin exercising their new form, newfound autonomy. Because again, before they were being persecuted. Remember? They were being persecuted. Now they are a little bit more free. Who saved them? Was it God that saved them or was it somebody else? And we'll get into that. It wasn't God that saved them, it was somebody else. But on top of that, they didn't just get autonomy. They also got authority, okay? Not just autonomy, also authority. And that allowed them to institute some pagan practices into the church. And this was through ecumenism and syncretism, okay? So next time, we're going to go into each one of these, and we're going to study them in detail the historical things that are being described in symbolism through the third trumpet. Okay? Because remember, there's no real persecution happening here. Not from people. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But what is being persecuted here? What's who, Who's the victim in this? Truth. The truth, but specifically what type of truth? How would you know what was true at this point? The Bible. The Bible. So what was the famine? Remember. There was no word of God. Okay. There was no word of God. So the persecution that's happening here is the persecution is God's word. That's what's on trial here. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. That's what's in, that's what went into hiding. God's word had to go into hiding now. Because Christianity now became, it went from being outlawed to being almost in vogue. Does that make sense? Right. And so with Christianity going from being outlawed to being like less marginalized to being... Um, well, the emperor is into it, so I guess I should be into it, right? There's a saying like, um, whatever my boss finds interesting fascinates me, <laughs> okay? It's the same thing with the emperor. So if the emperor finds something remotely interesting, the aristocracy finds it fascinating. The military finds it fascinating, Okay. So if the emperor finds Christianity even remotely interesting now, and he outlaws persecution of them, okay? Then the aristocracy, the former pagan uh, priest class, okay? They're like, huh, we couldn't beat them. It may be beneficial for us to join them. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. But some of the things that these Christians believe are kind of wacky. I don't know if I can fully embrace this carpenter for Nazareth thing. I don't even like the Jews. So let's see if we can kind of figure out a way that we can all kumbaya. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So next time we get together, we're going to go into these things. All right. Um, 
Give us a kind of an overview. What did you learn about wormwood? It's poisonous and toxic. And um, what we learned is that those that drank from the water, if you will, right, are the people that also became toxic and they propagated that toxicity and poison. So this is something I said um, the last session. Only one thing God really said um, remains pretty sound from this time period. And that is the concept of the Holy Spirit, right? That the Holy Spirit is a true member of the Godhead, all right? And also Jesus Christ and his atoning sacrifice, okay? Those are sound doctrines um, that were really, you know, brought forth by Jesus and the early apostles, all right? But any other doctrine that comes out of this time period, specifically this time period that we're talking about here, in from basically the, 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 the fourth through about the sixth century, we need to take it in with a ginormous glacier sized grain of salt. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because each generation was wormwood that built upon wormwood. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And since you have wormwood building itself upon wormwood, the doctrines are highly suspect. And so how do we actually get past all the things that are highly suspect? What do you think is the, the best way for us to get past all the things that we could doubt, potentially doubt? Get past it? What do you mean? Like, how, you know, if, if there's all these teachings that we... How do we, we confirm can, them? No, no. How do you spot a counterfeit? You know the real. Okay. And how do we know the real when it comes to the Christian walk and the Christian life? We study the Bible. We study the Bible. I'll, I'll, I think a lot of Christian um, teaching have been, but so-and-so said, and so-and-so said, and so-and-so said about so-and-so. Instead of just going straight to the core, as we have been doing in our series, go straight to the source, to the Gospels, to the epistles of, of Paul, to the epistles of Peter and John and James. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You can cut through so much um, wormwood. Does that make sense? Right. If there are things that are even remotely to put into question or doubt, go straight to the word. Put the things we've said to the test. Put the things your pastors and, and your, your, your theology professors. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Put it to the test by the word of God. Okay? Then you'll see if it's wormwood or if it's true. Because there's so much wormwood out there. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So I'll go ahead and pray to close this out. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this time that we can go in and study, Lord, how you told us beforehand that these things would happen. And even now, Lord, when thing, you know, so long ago that you gave us warning that these things would happen, we forget, Lord. And, and, and even those of us that, that have studied and seen, we neglect of the things you've, taught, you've told us. And there are so many out there, Lord, that have never known that you told us that there would be this corruption and this toxicity and this poisonous doctrine that would enter into your church. Lord, I pray that as we continue our study, that we can dispel some of this wormwood and some of these false doctrines 
that the wicked one has tried to de- bring into your church that has, just as he did in the garden, and tried to twist what you said, Lord. We pray that we can help unravel his lies and that the truth can shine free. In Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye.